Please and spell your last name for the court reporter. My name is Robert Tillotson, and my the spelling of my last name is T I L L O T S O N. How are you employed, sir? I'm an emergency physician with Mayo Clinic. How long have you been employed as an emergency physician with Mayo Clinic? Um, about two and a half years. And, doctor, prior to that, do you have experience uh, working as an emergency room physician? For about 30 years. Great. May I approach, Your Honor? Me. Thank you. Doctor, I have handed you what has been marked for identification as exhibit number 189. Can you tell me what that is? It's a curriculum vitae. It's my curriculum vitae. And is that uh, an up-to-date uh, curriculum vitae for you? Yes, it appears to be. And does it uh, go through your training, uh, your education, research that you've done, uh, as well as papers and other uh, matters that you've been involved in? Um, yes, it does. All right. Let's start with your uh, educational background, Doctor. Can you uh, tell us uh, where you went to college and when you, what you uh, majored in when you graduated? Yes, my undergraduate college was at Michigan State University, and I majored in medical technology. And then I went to medical school at Michigan State University at the College of Osteopathic Medicine. And what year did you graduate from college? From college in 1980 and from medical school in 1984. After you completed medical school, uh, did you do a residency? Yes, I actually did a rotating internship first, which was a generalized rotation throughout all different services, and then I did a residency in emergency medicine. And where did you do your residency in uh, emergency medicine? At Mount Carmel Mercy Hospital in the city of Detroit. And uh, do you have any uh, board certifications? Yes, I'm board certified in emergency medicine, and I'm also board certified in ultrasound. And uh, is your uh, board certification in emergency medicine current as of now? Yes. And were you so board certified in March of 2018? Yes. All right. Prior to working at uh, Eau Claire Mayo, uh, you said you did, uh, you've been an emergency uh, room doctor for about 30 years. Where did you work prior to the Mayo? Um, just prior to Mayo, I worked for 17 years in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. And then prior to that, I worked in Green Bay for two years. And then I worked in Iowa and Illinois while my wife did her training in internal medicine and cardiology. Now, uh, in addition to your work for 30 years in uh, emergency medicine, uh, do you have any teaching experience? Um, yes, uh, a fair amount of teaching experience. Can you describe some of that for the jury, please? Um, I've done a lot of educational things from education and coding and billing to um, my primary education has been in ultrasound, um, in a, the use of ultrasound in emergency medicine. Um, so I've done a lot of teaching um, both uh, individual courses across the nation. Um, and actually, that's why I came to Mayo Clinic Health Systems, was to help build and teach and educate in emergency ultrasound. I'm also currently the um, regional ultrasound, or the regional um, education chair for emergency medicine. And I'm also the education chair for directing education throughout the entire Mayo Clinic Health Systems um, throughout Minnesota and Wisconsin. Right. Your Honor, at this point in time, I'd move the admission of Exhibit 189. Any objection? No. All right, Exhibit 189 will be received. Now, as part of your work in uh, emergency rooms, uh, I imagine you see a wide variety of things. Um, everything and anything. You never know when you show up at work what you're going to see. And I may have, in your work in the emergency rooms over the last 30 years, have you seen wounds of various types? Um, pretty much every day I work, I see a wound of some type or another. And as part of that, have you had occasion to see uh, sharp force or knife wounds? Yes. Is that something you see on a regular basis? Um, fairly commonly, yes. 
And have you seen uh, knife wounds or sharp force injuries that have been self-inflicted? Yes. All right. Uh, and are there various types of self-inflicted knife wounds or sharp force injuries that you've seen? Um, yes. And what are the types typically of, of sharp force or knife injuries that you see when they're self-inflicted? Um, maybe you can clarify when you say types, what, what you're asking. Are, are you, do you see some where someone has attempted to commit suicide and, and where they inflict the in, injuries for other reasons? Sure. Well, we see a lot of self-inflicted wounds, um, um, and especially it's become more common for people to actually do cutting on themselves as a coping mechanism. So as I've been in practice over 30 years, the number of injuries have increased that are self-inflicted, so we see them much more commonly. Um, both um, when I was in Stevens Point and now at Mayo, we work in the Regional Psychiatric Center. We have a psychiatric inpatient hospital, so we end up seeing a lot of patients with attempted suicide and with cutting and depression, so we see a lot of self-inflicted wounds of various types from actually attempted suicides to um, just cutting for um, stress relief. And do they tend to look differently, uh, the ones that are self-inflicted for a, an attempted suicide versus ones that are uh, self-inflicted for coping or uh, stress relief? Yes, they, yes, they can. Um, most, a lot of self-inflicted wounds because people have a lot of control over what they, the, the wound that they inflict. They tend to have multiple wounds in one place, or they may have a single wound. A lot of times when somebody's really making an attempt to kill themselves, they may have a couple hesitation wounds, but then it's usually followed by a very deep or uh, intentional wound. People that are cutting tend to have a lot of superficial wounds that have a specific pattern. And that's one of the big things we notice with self-inflicted wounds is they tend to be patterned. They tend to be patterned and well-controlled. All right. And have you seen wounds where someone inflicts a wound on, on a, a, a knife wound or a, a sharp force injury on another person? Yes. And is that something you've seen relatively commonly as well? I've seen it, seen it throughout my career right. at different times. And have you also seen defensive wounds? Yes. And uh, now let's talk about... Uh, types of sharp force injuries, what is a laceration? Well, it, laceration is a confusing term in, in medicine. And the reason it's a confusing term is because when we do coding, any break of the skin, we use the term laceration. However, in the forensic world, laceration is a break in the skin due to a significant blunt force trauma. So they tend to be different than a cut or an incised wound. However, when we make a diagnosis, we call all of those basically lacerations. But forensically, they, they, they basically divide them into incised wounds or a laceration, which is a break in the skin due to a blunt force trauma. All right. And so uh, in the... When you're talking more in legal terms, a laceration would be some type of blunt force trauma that causes a break of the skin. Correct. And then an incised wound is caused by sharp force? Correct. All right. What, how do they look differently to you as an emergency room doctor, a laceration versus an incised wound? Well, um, when, you, when you look at a laceration, if you can imagine a force coming down onto the skin, it actually crushes the edges of the skin. We see it most commonly like in head injuries when people fall, fall on their face. It actually causes the skin to, when it hits up against like the bone, cause pressure and it just kind of crushes it and spreads it apart. We'll see bridging of the, the tissue underneath there, but it'll break the skin and subcutaneous tissue will, will bridge. But in a laceration, all of that gets cut through, and it usually has very sharp um, edges. And so they're an entirely different look when we see them. And what is an, ab an abrasion? An abrasion is a very superficial um, a damage to the skin surface. It usually goes through the epidermis and the dermis, but it never goes into the subcutaneous tissue. So an abrasion is a very superficial wound. And how do abrasions typically get caused? Well, they can be caused by anything from a motorcycle uh, accident where you're scraping across the asphalt to taking a paper clip and scratching your skin. So abrasions can happen all different types of ways. They're just very superficial wounds. And in medical terms, what is a contusion? A contusion is actually where there's been 
damage to the tissue and it actually causes a bruise or breaking of the blood vessels in that area. Now, uh, when you see an inflicted wound versus uh, a self-inflicted wound for coping or, or something like that, are there differences typically between those types of injuries, what you see? Um, uh, differences in uh, what are you referring to? Well, as far as the severity of those injuries. Um, they tend to, if they're just for coping, they tend to be fairly superficial, patterned, um, repetitive. You'll see multiple wounds in the same area and usually within the reach of their um, dominant hand because that's what they typically do. We'll see things like words carved into into extremities, um, um, like I encountered with my patient in this instance, is, um, or they'll also be in areas where they um, have pain or problems. A classic example is I had one person who had an amputation of his leg and he was very distressed about it, so he stabbed himself with a screwdriver in the amputation. Um, so they tend to be very patterned and specific following um, what where their stress is frequently. All right. And have you seen individuals uh, in your uh, work who have uh, defensively grabbed a knife uh, where their assailant has been uh, using to, or has been using to attempt to injure them? Yes. All right. And when someone does that, what do what have you typically seen as far as the uh, damage to the hand as a result of grabbing that knife, the sharp end of the knife? Well, uh, it typically the wounds are deep and they, they're, they're, a lot of times they're through the tendons because there's a lot of force. It's uh, The circumstances are not controlled like I see with a self-inflicted wound. They're typically uncontrolled. Uh, somebody's trying to overpower somebody else, somebody's trying to overpower the knife, and there's a lot of force. And neither one of the people have control over the force that they're inserting. So the wounds tend to be much deeper and varied in depth. Some can be superficial, but typically, especially with grabbing a sharp object that's pulled away, they tend to be fairly deep. All right. And uh, can they be on either the palm part of the hand or the finger part of the hand? Yes. All right. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. Doctor, I'm showing you two items, uh, num exhibit number 188 and exhibit number 196. Uh, I want to ask you a couple questions about each one of those. Okay. 196, by the way, Your Honor, we would move the admission of at this point in time. That was uh, filed as a learned treatise uh, with a notice, and we would move its admission uh, at this point in time. No, any objection to 196? Okay, right. Exhibit 196 will be received. All right. Now, Doctor, let's start with uh, Exhibit 188. Do you have that in front of you? Yes, I do. All right. And now Exhibit 188 uh, shows a uh, hand of an individual. Is that accurate? Yes. All right. And is that uh, based on your training, your experience, uh, typical of what you might see if someone grabbed the sharp end of a sharp part of a knife with the palm of their hand and attempt to wrest that knife away from an individual? This would be a wound that would, yeah, this would be a wound typical for that. Your Honor, I'd move the admission of Exhibit 188 and ask to publish that to the jury. Okay, any objection? No. All right, Exhibit 188 will be received and uh, you may publish it to the jury. You can turn the switch to the computer. So, doctor, what are we seeing here? Well, what you're seeing is um, uh, a laceration that goes across the palmar surface of the hand. It's deep, and you're actually seeing one right in the middle there, that white kind of angled thing is a tendon that's lacerated, and it goes up through and lacerates down right through the palm of the hand. It's a fairly deep laceration, and it also is somewhat angled. And, doctor, did you have occasion to see the injuries to the defendant's hand on the palm surface of her left hand. Um, yes. And would those, in your opinion, be typical of what you would see with someone who had grabbed the sharp end of a knife? No. Is this more typical? Yes. All right. And 
then moving to exhibit number 196. Could you turn to what is page 9 of 11 in that? Okay. And is that also uh, a photo of a, a knife wound uh, where someone had uh, attempted to grab a knife more with the finger area of the hand? Yes. And is that uh, something that in your experience and your training is more typical of what you would see uh, when that happens? Yes. All right. Ask to publish uh, that page, Your Honor, of uh, Exhibit 196 at this time. All right, you may. All right, so what are we seeing here, Doctor? Well, again, we're seeing another deep wound um, um, where the, la the knife was probably grabbed in a manner like this, and it cut all the way across through the fingers, starting from the hand there, all the way across through the fingers when it was grabbed. Um, and if you can imagine, the knife would have come right through here, and, and the laceration would have um, come through that section of the hand. All right. Thank you. Can switch off now. Thank you. Now, doctor, were you working on March 22nd of 2018? Yes. And uh, that was, was that in the emergency room at Eau Claire Mayo Hospital? Yes. All right. Uh, and at some point in time was the uh, defendant brought into that emergency room. Yes. And when she was brought in, can you explain how when patients come into the emergency room, how are they handled? Well, typically when somebody comes in based on their complaint, they're encountered by a nurse, usually a triage nurse or a nurse. Um, Ezra came in in police custody, so they brought her directly into a room and the nurse came in and did initial evaluation. And then from there, um, I'll usually review the record or talk to the police in a circumstance like that and go in and see, uh, see the patient. Um, in a case where there's an alleged sexual assault, I usually have a nurse with me when I go in to get the history and get information um, just because the person's been traumatized. Me being a male, I don't want to go in and somebody on my own with them and, and potentially traumatize them further because they've already been through possibly a, a pretty severe circumstance. So I'll go in and evaluate the patient. I usually try and get a history from them to find out what happened. And then we'll do a physical examination to assess for injuries. Because when a patient comes in under those circumstances or any circumstances, my job is, first of all, to intervene on life-threatening situations. And number two is to end up dealing, especially in a case like this, um, collection of evidences, which is where we bring in a SANE or a sexual assault nurse examiner to collect evidence. And then the third part is to deal with emotional or psychological trauma of the patient. So my job is to take care of this patient who's been through some type of event or deal, depending on whether it's a heart attack, a car accident or alleged sexual assault. And uh, in this case, then uh, the defendant was first seen by a nurse? Yes. And that would have been a female nurse? I believe so, yes. All right. And then you went in to see her? Yes. And did you do an examination of the defendant? Yes, I did. And did you also uh, make arrangements for a sexual assault nurse examiner to do an examination? Yes. And a portrait. Doctor, I have handed you what has been marked for identification as exhibit number 191. Uh, can you tell us what that is? This appears to be a printout from our electronic health record. Um, uh, regarding the care of um, uh, Ezra McCandless. All right. And that includes uh, your notes as well as notes uh, from uh, the ER nurse? 
Yes. Uh -huh. And who was the ER nurse? Um, Sarah um, uh, Schwindler or Weiner. I'm not sure. It's S-C-H-W-E-I-N-E-R. All right. And uh, Ms. Schweiner would have been the first person that would have seen the defendant in the uh, emergency room? Yes. All right. And then it includes your notes as well? Yes, it does. All right. And uh, a number of uh, exams were done and, and vitals were taken. Did that include, if you take a look on uh, what's marked as DOJ page uh, quadruple 072, which is the last page of that exhibit, does that include the defendant's weight at the time of admission? Yes, it says 63.5 kilograms. All right. And if we're converting from pounds, how do you do that? Um, well, um, actually, I... Sorry, what page are you on? Page 00072, DOJ. And it's, it's right about... the last page, the, counsel. About the middle of the page. So if you convert from kilograms to pounds, how do you do that? Um, I use an app on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so it's about a, about 130 pounds, somewhere in that neighborhood, but I basically just uh, convert it with that. Actually, I don't have a need to convert it since most of all of our dosage is done in kilograms anyway. But Okay, thank you. Now, when you met with the defendant, did you ask her what had happened to her? Yes, I did. And was she able to give you a history of what happened? Not really. She was very distraught, and she said that, um, according to my notes, that she didn't remember anything. And that was um, pretty consistent, that she had um, uh, difficulty remembering the events. Uh, by the way, Your Honor, I'd move admission of Exhibit 191 at this point in time Any as objection well. to 191? No. Exhibit 191 will be received, ladies and gentlemen. Did she tell you, uh, can you tell us whether or not she made some statements about driving to Eau Claire? Sure. Um, basically what she told me, she remembers she deri was driving to Eau Claire to meet Jason, and the next thing she knew she was in the emergency department. But she really didn't remember what happened to her. She thought she might have been sexually assaulted, but wasn't sure. Right. Did she ever mention... Uh, Alec, Alexander or Alex Woodworth during your conversations with her? No. All right. Now, uh, did you check the defendant to see if she had any head trauma? Um, yes. And is there any particular uh, tests that you do for to determine the person's alertness or their ability to uh, comprehend? There's a, it's called the Glasgow Coma Scale. And um, it's noted in the, in the record here. It's just kind of a generalized, accepted um, um, way of assessing uh, mental status. So it talks about um, Glasgow Coma Scale is do they open their eyes spontaneously? Are they able to converse and talk? And then are they able to move all their extremities? So all of those have a scoring thing. The highest score you can get is 15, which is what her score was, meaning that she was fully functional at that time as far as the basic neurologic functions. Now, in your uh, examination of the defendant, uh, did you do a, a full physical examination of her? Yes. All right. And did you notice any uh, injuries to her that drew your attention? Um, yes. Uh, the in um, when, when, you're, when you're dealing with a situation like that, the first thing is to assess for injuries because those need to be dealt with first. And I noticed the injuries on her left arm, and the injuries on her left arm were actually patterned in letters, um, which, which, which kind of struck me as being unusual or, and very concerning because somebody who went through a traumatic event, like a potential sexual assault, who's done that, these, were, look, these clearly look like they were self-inflicted wounds. And so then I went to assess to see what else was, what the other wounds looked like. All right. So when you say they were patterned, what were they patterned in? Well, there was a letter B and a letter O, and then kind of a triangle that looked like a Y. It almost looked like the word boy, and then there was a line across the top of it. 
um, and they were all patterned back towards where somebody would actually be in the orientation where if you were writing on a piece of paper, they would be oriented towards you, um, which is typically what I would see with somebody did letters in their own arm um, would be like that. And did those, did that pattern injury uh, raise any concerns for you? Well, the concern were that they were self-inflicted. And why is that? Why, uh, why is what? Why, why is that your concern at that moment? Well, the concern is that I have somebody who's been through a traumatic event who's now cutting on themselves. My big concern is, are they going to be mentally okay to go home? I don't want to let somebody who's been through an event like this go home and potentially kill themselves. So what I'm trying to assess if the wounds are self-inflicted, is this person a suicide risk? And so they needed a mental health evaluation was what was clearly when I felt that these were self-inflicted wounds, I needed to make sure that she was going to be safe or was brought into a safe environment. And did you, after you noticed that, did you continue your examination of the defendant? Yes. All right. Did you notice any other uh, wounds to the defendant? Um, yes, there was um, some abrasions on the back of her hand, more prominently on the right hand. Um, there were abrasions on her right leg. And then when I examined her with the sexual assault nurse examiner, there were these linear abrasions in her right groin. All right. And... Uh, the ones, let's start with the ones on her right leg. Uh, can you explain where they were on her right leg? They were on the lateral aspect of her right leg and there were multiple parallel lines and a few little kind of, look like little stab wounds um, that were there, but they had some uh, freshly clotted blood over them. Right. And uh, <coughs> when you say the lateral aspect of her leg, what is that? Lateral, I'm sorry, it's on the outside. Okay. And you were uh, pointing to yourself about midway down your uh, right leg? Correct. All right. And you said there were also some, uh, what was the other area where there were some? They were in, in the groin area here on okay. the right hand side. All right. And what did those look like? They were, again, very superficial, linear, uh, actually more abrasions like they were very superficial. All right. And uh, those injuries, were they also, did they tend to be parallel lines as well, like the ones on the leg? Yeah, fairly, fairly closely to that. And then you, were there any other injuries that you noted? Um, I think there was a little abrasion on her abdomen. Um, I did notice the ones in her hand, but um, I did not put those in my medical record. Okay. And where were the ones on the, which hand were they on? They were on her left hand. All right. And what did those look like? Well, they were, again, three parallel lacerations. Okay. Uh, superficial or deeper? Very superficial. As far as uh, all of the uh, lacerations or abrasions that you've described, uh, can you tell us whether or not they were similar in appearance or did they have a, a different appearance to each of them? They were all pretty similar. They were all very superficial. Um, they were all somewhat patterned in the same area. Um, so there was multiple ones in one area on the leg. There were multiple ones in the groin. And then the arm was patterned, and then there were multiple ones on the palm. All of those seemed to be patterned to be self-inflicted. They were all in, in, in um, reach of the, of the one hand um, of, the, of the patient. Right. Were they similar in depth? Yes. All right. Uh, were you present during the sexual assault nurse exam uh, when the uh, vaginal area was examined? Yes. Was there any injury to the vaginal area itself? Not that we saw, no. As far as the time of the injuries, did can you tell us whether or not they appeared to be at around the same time or were they significantly different in time? They looked like they were all created about the same time. They all had somewhat freshly clotted blood on pretty much all the, the wounds, except the most superficial ones were really red lines, but they looked like they were all created about the same time. And which ones are you talking about that were so superficial that just appeared to be red lines as opposed the to? ones in the groin were the most superficial of, of the wounds. All right. And those you said look more like abrasions than actual uh, incised wounds? Yes.
Now, doctor, if you, uh, assuming that the injuries like to the thigh that you observed were th through clothing, would that uh, assist you in trying to decide if they were self-inflicted or inflicted injuries? Well, the big thing is, is they were all of kind of similar depth. So, um, you know, I, I do incisions on skin all the time. I never, I don't have any idea how deep the scalpel is going to go until I put the scalpel on and I start to cut and then I adjust my pressure as I go. So I actually have to look to adjust how deep the wound goes. You put something like clothing or something in there, I, I have no way of seeing or knowing. So the thing is, is all these wounds are all superficial, the same depth, so it requires a considerable amount of control, and I would suspect probably being able to feel. Um, so I would, again, think that that would be consistent, even if they were made through clothes with being self-inflicted. And there were multiple ones in the same place, and to be able to do multiple cuts at the same time through clothes on another person and maintain the same depth without being able to feel what's happening underneath, I think would be incredibly difficult. I don't think I could do it. And you've been an emergency room doctor for 30 years? Yes. All right. Now, as far as the injuries themselves, what type of treatment did those injuries require? They were all very superficial. None of them required any uh, repair or um, any sewing. They were just basically cleaned. All right. Uh, and did you have to bandage any of them? Um, I, I don't think we bandaged any of them, just some antibody ointment. All right. Now, do you have an opinion as to the, whether or not these injuries that you observed were self-inflicted or inflicted? Well, clearly, and from my medical record, um, I, I felt that they were self-inflicted. And um, that's why I wanted to have a mental health evaluation done on the patient. Objections noted. And, uh We've already, we can already rule on that. Thank you. And was that, is that opinion based upon your careful consideration of your observations you made on March 22nd of 2018, along with all your training and your experience as an emergency room doctor for the last 30 years? Yes. What involvement have you had in this case uh, what involvement have you had in this case? Basically, I, I cared for my. I mean, basically, I cared for my patient, and then when I've been brought in to do the depositions afterwards, or, or the testimony, and then testifying today. Yes. And your basic, you're testifying based upon, uh, as as a treating physician for the defendant. Yes. Were you hired at any point in time by the state to give an opinion as to what you felt about these injuries? No. And are you being paid anything outside of your regular salary as a emergency room doctor for a male? No. Doctor, I have handed you what has been marked for identification as exhibit number 195. Can you tell me what that is? Um, it's a chapter on forensic emergency medicine from a textbook um, uh, of emergency medicine. All right. Your Honor, an exhibit 195 was also submitted as a warranted treatise, and we would move the admission of it at this point in time. All right. Counsel, any objection? All right. Exhibit 195 will be received. And was that also something that you consulted with and uh, used in helping to form your opinion as to uh, the cause of these injuries to the defendant? Not at the time, but this is the textbook we used in my training, and it's the textbook that I use in reference to this day. Um, but when I cared for the patient, I did not re review, review this. Right. But you've reviewed it since? Yes. And does it support your opinions as well? Yes. All right. And uh, is the same true of Exhibit 196, which we previously talked about? 
That's the uh, yes. All right, and uh, that again is not something I assume you looked at while you were in the emergency room, uh, but something you've con consulted since then. Yes. And does it also support the opinions that you're uh, giving us here today? Yes. All right. I don't have any other questions for Dr. Tillotson at this point. Great. Uh, Ms. Bishney, are you doing cross? Yes. Go ahead. Thank you. <coughs> Doctor, you have exhibit number 195 in front of you, this forensic emergency medicine text? Correct. So you said you, you saw this book in your training? Correct. That was quite a while ago, right? Yes. So it's a much older book? Oh, it's had, this is a brand new edition in my hand. Okay. It's been a, it's been kind of a standard book in emergency medicine for years. It's one of the core um, foundational textbooks in emergency medicine. I'm going to ask you to turn your attention to, I'm not sure what page it is. It's E14 at the top, DOJ 2708 at the bottom. Okay. Um, if you need my help finding it, I'll come over and show you no, where I am. I've got it right here. It, right. This came unstable, by the way. We can stay. I'm sure they can staple it back, but thanks for telling us. So, in this book, in this section, this chapter of forensic emergency medicine, there's, there's all kinds of things in this long chapter that really have nothing to do with what we're talking about here, right? Correct. In fact, most of the chapter has to do with gunshot wounds, right? Correct. And uh, other blunt force pattern injuries. Right? Correct. All right. So, um, but, and car accidents. Correct. Right? So there's a very small section in this chapter about knife wounds. Fair? Correct. And in this very small section, there's actually a box on page 2708 that highlights the characteristics of self-inflicted knife wounds. Correct. And the very first thing it says is there's multiple superficial incisions on the anterior trunk, that's the front, right? Correct. Arms and face. Yes. Now, as far as Miss McCandless, when you saw her, you have the wound, I'm just going to call it the boy wound on the forearm. That's on the arm, right? Correct. And we can all agree that that wound is self-inflicted. Correct. Be and you noticed that, and that was the first thing you really noticed when you noticed her wounds, was boy. Yes. And you noticed that she had written letters into her arms, and you said you've seen something like this before. Yes. And you didn't see any wounds on her face. No. Right? And on her anterior trunk, or in her abdomen, what you saw was pretty small, like a scratch. Yes. And by the way, when you examined her, um, this was when the same nurse was in the room, right? Um, I examined her with uh, the other nurse and with the same nurse bowl. Well, I'll come back to that, okay? Um, when you talk about the next thing that it says here is that you may see parallel incisions in close proximity to each other on the non-dominant side of the body, right? That's what it says there, correct. Right, but really, just about all the wounds you saw were on Miss McCandless's right side. Yes, it also says in there linear or curved incisions towards a hand inflicting the wound, which yes. is consistent with why I believe these were self-inflicted wounds. Yes. So this book here, one of the things you have to realize from a textbook is these are characteristics. They're not applicable to every case. An example is a, the person who stabbed themselves with a screwdriver. I don't see that here in the box, but yet those were so, that was a self-inflicted wound. So although these are general characteristics, they're not etched in stone. Well, you're not trying to suggest that Ms. McCandless has an amputation and stabbed herself with a screwdriver, right? No, what I'm trying to do is establish the fact that based on the pattern of the wounds, these clearly look to be self-inflicted. They were within the reach of her hand. They were oriented towards the way a hand movement would be. All of the wounds were. Well, that's your opinion. That was my opinion, and it's what I documented in my medical record. Okay, but nonetheless, regardless of your opinion, the author of this well-respected text 
thought this was significant enough to highlight that they're usually on the non-dominant side of the body, correct? What they did is they used the word characteristics. Are you disagreeing that that's written here? I'm not disagreeing what is written, but I'm trying to define it. So this book, which was important enough for you to receive in medical school, says when it talks about characteristics, parallel incisions in close proximity to each other on the non-dominant side of the body. That is correct, isn't but it? That is what is written there, absolutely. And the very next thing that's written there, besides what you've already pointed out about linear and curved incisions, is that it is sparing of sensitive body areas. Correct. I'm showing you what's been previously marked as exhibit number 174. Is that the, uh, that's, that's been received? Yes. Right? Okay. And I'm just going to show this to you. I'm not going to put this up on the screen. Sure. Okay. What you're seeing here is a photograph of Miss McCandless's genital area. Correct? Correct. And her inner thigh. Correct. And there are these wounds in her pubis mons. Yes. Right? But not in her labia. Um, not from what I can see there, but no, they're not in her labia. Okay. But they are definitely on the inner thigh. Yes. And you see, let's see, let's count up how many we have in the pubis mons. Let's see if we agree. One, two, three, four, five. Would you say there are five? of these scratches in the pubis mons area? Some are faint, some are darker? Yes. So they're not all exactly the same depth, right? Correct. And then moving over to the inner thigh, you can see two wounds which seem to be of a slightly different depth because there's more blood clotting there? Correct. So there's some signs of blood clotting on the inner thigh? Yep, and they're all extremely superficial, barely breaking the skin surface. What, say that again? I'm just, I... I said they're all extremely superficial, barely breaking the skin surface. Yeah, yes, you have told us that. Um, and moving farther away into the inner thigh, you see another two different scratches correct. or knife wounds, correct? Yes. And turning uh, to the next page in this exhibit, that's just another view of the same wounds, correct? Correct. So when you wrote in your medical record that she had wounds on the labia, that was not correct? Um, I'll have to refer to it here. Certainly, doctor. If you would go to exhibit number 191 to page... Uh, go to page 52, which is DOJ 70. Well, there's a diagram on this page, right? Correct. And in that diagram, there are some parallel lines that you drew What using um, a mouse, a computer mouse. Yes. Uh -huh. So when you use a computer mouse, it's not the same as taking a pen and drawing exactly no. what you see. No, and not at all. it's fair to say that you're a doctor, not an artist. Correct. Unless you're referring to the art of medicine, of course. Yes. <laughs> And um, in these parallel lines that you drew, they show lines right onto the labia, correct? Well, again, with have you ever tried to sign your name with a mouse? Or be real accurate with lines with a mouse? It's very difficult. We just started using Epic um, in July, and this is just a short time afterwards. So experimenting with this, realized that this was not a very good way to document that and I knew there were pictures on there and can you tell me where in here I said it went to her labia because here I said that the wounds are in her groin well actually right under the diagram the next words are there's an injury to the right labia okay thank you for pointing that out so that's right there where they came to the edge of the area of right. her no I know epic is the bane of the doctor's existence yeah amen right? but Regardless of Epic being the bane of the doctor's existence, you would agree that the photographs are accurate and this drawing is not accurate. Correct. correct? Absolutely. And so actually there was no wound to the labia, right? Correct. It was to the pubis mons. Yes, right? and to the, to the, well actually technically uh, to the labia majora on the outside there, if you show me the pictures again, it might extend onto there, but I, Again, the pictures are as good as we have of, of a record of that. The, the pictures are the real evidence. This is just a not great computer drawing, which Correct. is because of medical records, electronic medical records. 
right? Correct. Now, you did examine the patient from head to toe? Yes. And you say that you think you did it before the same nurse came in? I did. I did it in combination. I did a general exam with the patient, and then I completed the exam with the same nurse. I'm going to show you. Could I see counsel, since it is my oh, witness? I'm sorry. Thank you. Dr. Tillotson, you testified before in the hearing in this matter. Yes. You referred to it as a deposition, but it was actually a court hearing, right? Correct. And in that hearing, do you remember talking, uh, answering um, a question about how you conduct a physical exam? Yes. Oh, I, I remember vaguely. If you could allow me to refer to that, if you have a question regarding it, I'd appreciate it. Sure. And what was the date of that hearing again, counsel? And this hearing was on March 8th of this year, right? Um, yes. Right in this very courtroom. Yes. And I questioned you at that time. Yes. Um, but first, the prosecutor questioned you. And turning to page eight, I'll show you the cover page and okay. who's doing the questioning. Just okay. All right. So you know at this point that th this is the questionings by uh, Ms. Nodolf, the prosecutor. Okay. Correct. Correct. All right. And Ms. Nodolf asked you this question: How do you conduct a physical exam? Right. Look at page line okay, 20. Okay, all right. Okay, yes. And you answered that question, correct? Yes. And what you said when you were under oath at that time is that when it's an alleged sexual assault, we don't do that examination until the sexual assault nurse examiner is there. Correct. So you talk about, and really I should have read the whole thing, initially you try to assess mental status, talking, action, interactivity, and then a basic physical, right? Correct. And what you said when you were under oath about six months ago was that you don't do that until the same nurse is in the room. Correct. correct? Thank you. So although today you're remembering it differently, six months ago you testified that you did not do the physical exam until the same nurse was in the room. That is not true. Well, that's what you said under oath, right? Actually, I've said the same thing then and now. I basically went in and evaluated the patient, and then when the sexual nurse, assault nurse examiner came in, then we did the pelvic exam. I've said the same thing twice. Well, let's just put up your actual words on the screen. Oh, that went too... Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm not very good at this. All right. Well, here's the question. After the initial history, what you said was after the initial history, you then did a physical exam on her, right? Correct. That was your answer. And then the question from Ms. Nodolf was, how do you conduct a physical exam? Right? Right. And then your answer was, initially we try to assess mental status, you know, talking, action, interactivity, and then we go through a basic physical exam from head to toe. Correct. And then your words... With an alleged sexual assault, though, we don't do that examination until the sexual assault nurse examiner is there. Right? That is correct, but that was referring to the pelvic examination. So those words aren't in there, but that's what that was referring to. So you made a mistake when you were testifying before? Um, I don't know that I made a mistake. It's just not entirely clear. Well, your very next words on the page were so that, and then it goes to the end of the page, right? Yes. So that, and then the next part, what, what you said again, your words, that part was not done initially until the same nurse was there. Correct. So that's what you said in court. I guess I don't know what the point is. I basically went in and evaluated the patient, and then when the same nurse came there, then we did the final, the sexual assault examination. Okay, doctor, apparently I'm not going to change your mind because you testified differently before, so I'll move on. Well... I would move on because I didn't change my mind. I did the same thing. You're just trying to mince words. I was caring for a patient who was allegedly sexually assaulted, and I wanted to make sure she was okay. I was not going to do an intimate exam until the sexual assault nurse examiner was there because I wasn't going to do it twice. It's not fair to my patient. So you can mince all the words you want, but it doesn't change what I did that day. 
Okay. And what you did that day happened a year and a half ago, right? Yes. You've taken care of many, many patients in the emergency room? Yes. Right? Every day is a busy day? Yes. And um, by the way, you've referred to your training. Um, you're not a member of the uh, forensic, um, you, you have a number of different memberships and specialties, right? Um, yes. And you're very specialized and have a great deal of knowledge about ultrasound technology. Correct. And sonography, right? Yes. And that's mostly what you teach about. Yes. You, in your vast teaching experience, right? Is that correct? Correct. Not forensic medicine. Well, actually, I did a medical rotation on forensics in the inner city of Detroit with Werner Spitz, the person who wrote this book. And I did a presentation in my residency class on forensics where we outlined gunshot wounds, knife wounds, blunt trauma. And that was part of my one of my residency presentations. So I have taught on it. It's been a number of years. Well, let's talk about how many years that's been. What year it's was it? It's been that? 30. Huh? It's been, I graduated from my residency in 1990. Okay. But I practice it every day. Well, I understand that. So you were in the city of Detroit at that time, right? Correct. Detroit, we can agree, is one of the largest cities in the United States. Well, it's a very large city, yes. Uh -huh. And there's a great deal of violent crime there? Correct. A great deal of homicidal crime there? Correct. And so when you were in Detroit, you did a uh, you said it was a, a rotation in forensic medicine? Correct. Now, a rotation means, well, first, when you become a doctor, first thing you do is you go to medical school, right? Correct. And then you do a residency. Correct. And in emergency res medicine, is that residency three years or four years? Depends on the residency. Some are three, some are four. How about yours? Well, mine, actually, I did a year of internship and then a three-year emergency medicine residency. Okay. So the first year of internship was not, that. that's when you're brand new doctor, right? Correct. That wasn't in this forensic rotation? Um, no. It was the next year? No, it was two years later. So two years after your internship, you did this residency you're talking about? Yes. Now, this is after you went to osteopathic medical school? Correct. At... I think you said Michigan State? Correct. Right? And um, so if I'm looking at your curriculum vitae, you're in, you did uh, your internal medicine internship in 1986, right? Yes. Is um, that correct? Yes. And then the forensic medicine, you said 1988. Um, I believe it was either, night. it was in February of... 1989 is, I believe, when I did my uh, forensic medicine rotation. So your curriculum vitae, which you've had the opportunity to prepare and review yourself, is wrong? No. Actually, what it, when I, um, I went and did a, as, as a DO, we were required to do a rotating internship when I trained. Most of the allopathic or MD rotations, they went from medical school directly into residency. We as DOs end up doing a year internship. So we do a rotation through everything, which includes emergency medicine. And when I completed that, I actually applied for a surgical residency, got the surgical residency. And at that point in time, the thought of the government was is that surgery was causing the cost of medicine to be high. So they basically defunded surgical uh, residency. So the residency that I, was, uh, that I received ended up becoming defunded. So I ended up not having a residency after my internship. So I went and worked in the emergency department for a year. And I went and actually then and thought maybe I was misdirected in my career and um, did internal medicine for two months. Realized that I have a thing that I just am so dedicated to patients I can't shut it off. I needed some definition in my life. So what I ended up doing was I left internal medicine, went back and worked in the ER, and then I started my ER residency in 1987 and completed my ER residency in 1990. So kind of a convoluted way to figure out where God wanted me to do my career, but that's how I ended up in emergency medicine and I ended up in the right place because that's really where my heart has been. So obviously you have a great deal of passion for what your work is. Oh, absolutely. Okay. And I appreciate that. But doctor, if you would look at, and I, I don't mean to be snotty, but if you would look at exhibit number 189, my question was on your curriculum vitae, which you prepared, it shows that your rotation in forensic medicine was in 1988, right? Okay. Yeah. 1988. I'm sorry. I misspoke. Thank you. And it's in February. All right. 
So it was in February, but it wasn't for a whole year. No, it was a one month rotation. Oh, okay. So during this one month rotation, every student, so you're still kind of a student. You're a doctor, but still a student of medicine when you're a resident, right? I'm still a student of medicine. I'll be a student of medicine till the day I stop. Well, just like everybody's a student of life and I'm a student of law, your experience back in 1988 when you did this one month rotation was you were much earlier in your studies during that period of time. Oh, absolutely. I wish I was that young now. <laughs> Don't we all, doctor? <laughs> in any event, during this one month rotation, the residents who are in a very early part of their training, this was the first year of your residency, right? Um, 87 was the first year of my residency. Okay, so it's the second year you do one month rotation and you're supposed to present a paper at that time, right? Um, well, we present a paper during a residency. Yeah, everybody a presentation. Does that. Yes. Right? That's a requirement of your training. Correct. Right? So, over 30 years ago, during a one month rotation, you did a presentation, and it wasn't just about knife wounds, it was about gunshot wounds, too. Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of gunshot wounds in Detroit. Yes. Big city, lots of homicides, right? Right. Lots of fatal stabbings. Yes. Lots of force. Yes. You left Detroit in 1990. It was about yes. 1990? Yes. And since then, you have practiced basically in much smaller communities, right? Correct. So you practiced in the, um, in uh, the small community of Rock Island, Illinois, for a couple of years? Correct. Then you moved on for several years in Iowa and the small communities of Adamwam? 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 Atumwa, Iowa. Atumwa, thank you. Well, actually, just to clarify, is that my wife was doing her fellowship at the University of Iowa in Iowa City, and I worked for a contract group that basically contracted with ERs around Iowa. The first year I was in Rock Island, Illinois, and the contract group that I worked with lost their contract because they couldn't recruit people to Rock Island, Illinois. People didn't want to live there. So I ended up then working for a contract group in Iowa that basically covered ERs in Waterloo, Ottumwa, Dubuque, and I worked in those different ERs. Right, that's what I was going to ask you. You were in Ottumwa, Waterloo, and Dubuque, all smaller communities, right? Yes, and then at that same time, because I like to work with residents and teach, I also took a teaching position with uh, the University of Illinois in Peoria um, and actually taught there, and I would go down there um, uh, frequently and work in their ER and teach as well. And Peoria is also a smaller community than Detroit, right? Well, it's smaller than Detroit, but it's a fairly big community. Well, it's like more like the size of Green Bay, right? Um, I don't know exact population. Well, after you were done working in the ERs in these small communities, you then worked in a small community of uh, Sturgeon Bay and then somewhat bigger Green Bay for a couple of years in the late 90s, right? Right. That's 20 years ago. Yes. And since then, you've never worked anywhere as large as Green Bay. No. Right? Then you worked in Portage, Wisconsin, also a smaller community for about five years. Correct. Then you also worked in the small communities of Stevens Point and Merrill, Wisconsin. Well, right? in Portage, that's Stevens Point in that area. Correct. And Stevens Point is smaller than Eau Claire? Yes. Then you come to Eau Claire in 2017? Right? Yes. And that's the biggest place you've been since Detroit, right? Correct. Now... You don't have a lot of homicides coming into the emergency room in Eau Claire, do you? No, not a lot, no. You don't have a lot of knife wounds coming in? Um, I guess, nope. Okay. Now... I, I guess the question comes up, knife wounds... I, I don't want to be rude, but I'm supposed to ask a question and then you're supposed to answer them. And I don't mean to be rude, but um, if we could just proceed that way, I would appreciate it. Well, sure. I, I'd appreciate the opportunity to answer the question correctly, too. Oh, okay. Well, if you feel you didn't answer it correctly before and you'd like to correct yourself, please, I'm sorry, please go ahead. Well, the thing is, is when you say, did I see a lot of knife wounds? Um, knife wounds is a generic statement. I see utility knife wounds. I see um, self-inflicted wounds. I see occasional stab wounds. So I, see a, I still see a fair number of knife wounds. So I, I wanted to correct that statement. I'm sorry. Okay. But these horrible defensive wounds that you've seen, you mostly saw that working in Detroit, right? Most of them there, yes. I've seen them since then, but most of them were there. All right. And as far as, um, let's see, I think, um, one minute. 
You assumed that the wounds to Ms. McCandless' hands could not be defensive wounds because they were superficial, right? Well, actually, the reason I thought that they weren't, I had no reason to think necessarily that they were necessarily defensive wounds. I came in with a clean slate. I looked at a patient that came in with an alleged sexual assault that could have been assaulted by someone else. And actually, the surprise to me was the wounds were, uh, looked to me like they were self-inflicted when I saw the wounds on her arm. Then when I looked at her hand and saw three parallel superficial wounds, those all looked like they were created by the same hand and they were all very superficial. They were not consistent with what I've seen or been taught in the past, where if somebody grabbed a knife, they would have a, a, a deep wound, and to have three superficial wounds right next to each other would be incredibly unusual grabbing a knife. And then to see other superficial wounds, they all fit the pattern. It's just like defensive wounds fit a pattern. Most defensive wounds are on the arm because people on the extensor surface of the arm because they're trying to protect themselves from somebody stabbing themselves with a, or slashing at them with a knife, or even shooting at them, they hold up their arm to try and protect themselves. So patterns are important in trying to understand what creates a wound. So when you grab a knife, you cut yourself deeply, right? Most likely, yes. But if you reach for a knife and touch it, and maybe move your hand, but you don't grab it, you're not going to get that deep kind of wound you're talking about. Fair? Um, I, I, I guess. Thank you. Now, your opinion is that when somebody is attacking somebody at knife, they're using a great deal of force, right? Typically. And typically when they're using so much force, the knife is going in pretty deeply when they're attacking somebody, right? Well, there's going to be very less... The, the thing is, is... The circumstances are completely uncontrolled, so there's going to be varying depths of wounds in, a, in an assault attack. And often you will see hilt marks from a knife? That's when the knife's been... What, it, what the hilt of the knife is, is a very... You know how the blade comes and ends? That hilt is a very a tip of the knife. It's kind of the thing that will protect your hand from sliding onto the blade. And when somebody has a deep wound that the knife stabbed all the way in down to that hilt, that hilt gives me a clue that that knife went all the way in. So that tells me that there's likely deep organs that are injured. So we always look for that kind of pattern in a wound to see if there's been a hilt wound or an abrasion from a knife. Because then that tells me, boy, that knife, depending on how long it is, really went into the body. So that's why, the, that's why I think she's referring to the hilt wound. Well... I'm referring to it because when you testified previously, you said that most stabbings occur with a lot of force, right? Right? Yes. And when they happen with a lot of force, there's a hilt wound. You said that before, correct? Yeah, if the knife is all, goes all the okay. way down to the hilt, yes, absolutely. Okay. And just like before, when you testified, you, I asked you, you can have superficial wounds and defensive wounds, correct? Correct. Remember saying that? Mm hmm and you agreed with that, that that can happen, that it's po certainly possible, right? Yep, I agree that it's possible, yes. And so in your practice in all of these various small towns, as opposed to your first few years in Detroit, kind of the, some people call it the murder capital of America, you've seen a lot less of these very intense stab wound fights, right? That's correct. A lot of times what you've seen are, in fact, accidents, right? Correct. And, you know, farmers, other people, factory workers come in, they've had accidents with wounds, right? Correct. Okay. So, after the boy wound, um, and after you looked at the other wounds, your opinion was that they were consistent with uh, a self-inflicted injury, right? Correct. But they also can be consistent with being inflicted by another person, right? No. All right. So... There is nowhere in medical literature that you can cite to that would definitively state that these kinds of wounds are always done by another person, right? I'm afraid I don't understand your question. All right. Well, let me ask you this. When, before you became a witness in this case, you did, you wrote a medical record, right? Correct. And in that medical record, you dictated your impressions about this case. Correct. You did that right after you saw Ms. McCandless, right? Correct. And you only seen her once. Correct. Wasn't for that long, right? Correct. Her care was turned over to other people after you saw her as a patient in the emergency room. Yes. Right? 
You noted that she was very distraught when you saw her? Yes. She was shaking in bed? Yes. Now, you said the police brought her in, right? Correct. But by custody, you don't mean she was under arrest. You just mean she was with the police, right? right? Correct. And people were with her at all times? Yes. Right? Um, she wasn't left alone. Not that I'm aware of. Even when she went and changed into a hospital gown, they Not, were with her. Right? I, I wasn't with her at that time, so I can't speak to that. Okay. And you don't personally know whether she stepped on a scale to be weighed. You just know that was her noted weight, right? Correct. That could have been taken off her driver's license. I have no idea who, who put it in there or what was put on there. I didn't document that. Okay. So, you know, when a patient is injured or distraught, one doesn't necessarily say, hey, get on the scale, right? I mean, um, that doesn't always necessarily happen. Well, I, again... Um, Doctor, that doesn't always necessarily happen, right? Right. No, we don't always get all the vital signs. No. Okay. So, she was also rating her pain in the genital area as being very high, correct? Um, she uh, Actually, I don't recall her rating her pain there. Um, let me look if at my you record. Look at page 191. Counsel, just remind you, please don't overtalk the witness. Just oh, I'm so sorry. Just, I know it. I, just calm down. Okay. okay. Number one, number page 191. She was complaining of genital pain. If you look under the note on the very first page, very first page, doctor. I'm sorry. These are the notes by the nurse. Sure. Okay, Schweiner. this is by, by the nurse, correct. She, the, no, the nurse noted that she complained of genital pain, and she was feeling it was a 10 out of 10 at that point, right? That's what she told the nurse. And we all agree pain is subjective. Correct. Right? Some people have very high pain tolerances, right? Correct. Some people have low pain tolerances, right? What's a 2 to me could be a 10 to you or vice versa. I agree. And... You also had a history of the present illness written down, right, And on the uh, next page. Correct. And what you noted was that she was found out in a field running around? That's what I was told by the police. Okay. And so you don't know if that's actually accurate or not. You just know the police told you that, right? I just reflect the, the history. The history is what people tell me, and I try and document that as best I can. That's fine. And what you also documented was that, and looking at the very last line in the history section, that she could not tell you whether she was assaulted or not, but she thought she might have been, right? Correct. Now, you went ahead and had uh, some other um, vital signs um, taken. If you look at page 68, there's like her temperature, her pulse, et cetera, et cetera, right? Fair? On the bottom of page 68? Yes. All right. And there, under those vital signs, it says temperature, pulse rate, correct? Correct. Heart rate is blank, meaning there was no heart monitor on, I'm assuming, compared to pulse? Well, it's, yeah, it's just the, the way that the it documents the pulses. If somebody pulses, uh, checks a pulse and documents it versus heart rate if they take it off the monitor. And her blood pressure was 137 over 69? Yes. And then you have the section on the physical examination, right? Yes. You said she was anxious and intermittently tearful? Yes. Then turning to the next page, this is the picture with the not-so-great mouse drawing that is the fault of medical records, right? Well, if you can draw a better picture with a mouse, teach me. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, doctor, I'm not really in a position to do that because I'm not too good at it either. Um, as you look down that paragraph, um, you made some notes um, about her uh, abrasions and lacerations to her left arm with the boy yes. comment, right? And that things, there were cross lines like a triangle with the word boy, this pattern injury, right? Yes. And then you also mention uh, the lines in the right side that we've talked about. Right? Yes. The lines on the groin area that we've talked about. Right? Yes. The abrasion on her right abdomen. Yes. And then the very next word is these wounds look like they could be self-inflicted. Yes. You didn't choose to write were self-inflicted when you did your medical record right at the time. Correct. Then, and you also then use the word consistent with self-inflicted, right? I believe so. Very next line. 
you uh, talked about um, in the psychiatric that her mood was anxious. She was tearful, right? Correct. She was slow and withdrawn, right? Correct. You said her cognition and her memory were impaired. Right. And she did not express any homicidal or suicidal ideation. So she wasn't expressing she wanted to kill anybody else or herself for that Correct. matter. Right? But she did have an abnormal recent memory. Right? right. She said she didn't remember what happened. Now, turning to page 72 on the bottom, DOJ 72. Yes. Um, your job was done um, pretty early, and then you turned her over to another doctor, right? Right. And that doctor was Dr. Paul Horvath? Correct. And uh, he is actually a medical doctor, what you called allopathic medicine, right? Yes, he has an MD degree, correct. And then he has a note that starts with the words, care of patient transferred to me by Dr. Tillotson, right? Yes. And what he wrote is there's a question if the wounds may be self-inflicted. Correct? Correct. So that night there was a question about what was going on, right? Right. Now, generally speaking, in medical diagnoses, you've been a doctor a long time. Um, some cases are easy and some cases are difficult. Would that be fair to say? Yes. Okay. And when you have a difficult case medically, Sometimes you have to call in other people to make a diagnosis, right? Um, yes. Sometimes there's information that comes in later. Yes. And that information that comes in later can change a diagnosis. Yep. Because although first impressions are often correct in medicine, they're not always correct, right? Correct. And that's why people get second opinions, for example, right? Yes. I mean, sometimes a doctor will say, well, you have cancer, you should have a mastectomy, and then a doctor will, another doctor will come in and might say something different, right? Yes. And in fact, if you had a serious medical condition, you would go get a second opinion, wouldn't you? Depends on whether I thought the initial opinion was right or not. Okay. But you have some specialized information because you're a doctor, right? Right. Um, you would certainly tell a patient if they didn't agree with your opinion to go get a second opinion, right? Um, yeah, it's certainly that's their option, absolutely. Okay, and I mean, you know a lot, but you're not the end-all or be-all of medicine, not, not to offend you or anything. Oh, I, yeah, I'm not offended. I'm not perfect, and I realize okay. that. Do you read the New York Times? Um, no. Okay, so you're not familiar with the column in the New York Times where they talk about difficult cases and how there's always a wrong diagnosis. No. But Objection, some... relevance, Your Honor, and sustain. Okay, but you're aware of cases where there's an initial diagnosis. It's very puzzling to people. Right? Right. People don't know what's going on, right? And then after a series of time, more information is gathered, right? Right. More medical tests are done. Correct. More information is from a patient, correct? Correct. And if a patient has amnesia, they may be able to fill in details at a later date that they can't initially give somebody. Correct? That's true. If a person is suffering from post-traumatic stress or dissociative disorder, they may give information later once that disorder has cleared up, right? Yes. And you know that that diagnosis happens when people come in who've been through traumatic experiences, right? Yes. So certainly more information from the patient, in this case Ms. McCandless, has, if, if given more information, there would be an opportunity to further reflect upon a diagnosis, right? Yes. And to give more information. Doctor, do you know what BDSM is? Um, I'm not sure what you mean when you say BDSM. Okay. Well, some people call it bondage, dominance, sadism, and masochism. Objection, relevance. Overruled. Do you know what BDSM is? Um, no. All right. So you've never seen a patient come in to your emergency room who has had injuries as a result of a type of sexual practice called BDSM, have you? No. So that's something you're completely unfamiliar with? It's not, I've never dealt with that, no. All right. Nor have you apparently read any medical journals about it? No. Or anything in any uh, continuing medical education seminar? You haven't had that? No. So BDSM is pretty rare. It must be pretty rare in the Eau Claire area if you've never seen a patient like that, right? 
probably, yes. And pretty rare in all these other smaller communities <clears throat> you've worked in. You've never seen that before, right? Correct. So if it's more common, one might see that more if they had worked for a long time, let's say, in a larger city. Fair? I don't know if they'd see it more or not. Okay. But when you were in training, BDSM was not something you were ever trained about, right? Correct. You've heard of the movie Fifty Shades of Grey? I've heard of the movie. I've never seen it. Okay. Neither have I. But you've heard it's a well-selling movie and book, right? Uh, I, don't, I don't know much about it. Okay. Honest. So you didn't know that that very popular book and movie were about BDSM, right? Objection relevance, Your Honor. Stained on that ground. Now, you've never heard of a kind of BDSM called edge play? No. So you're not aware that in BDSM, somebody's supposed to have a safe word? I, again, I am not familiar with that. Okay. Or that when people do something that's a little edgier in BDSM, that there's no Your safe Honor, word? Your Honor, I'm going to object. This witness has said he doesn't know about this area. And I'm going to sustain, and I think you're... Judge, I'd like to be heard at sidebar. All right. And I just have one more question about that. You've never heard of a subset of that then called knife play, right? No. You're not familiar with it? No. So you would agree that the wounds that you saw are from somebody laying very still, correct? These, um, these you, you talked about how yes. if somebody self-inflicts a wound, they have a lot of control, so they can do something like not move their arm, right? Correct. And it's also consistent with somebody laying very still and having these marks carved in them by another person, right? The ones that I saw don't seem to be consistent with that. If a person was very still, took a knife and held it still, by another person. We'll just have you try it on me. The pen is closed. Well, Your Honor, I'm going to object. I'm not going to have this. Oops, sorry, my phone's off. We're not going to have the doctor drawing on, on counsel. Well, he wasn't going to draw on me because the pen isn't on. I, I was going to have to draw on me. Okay, well, I think we get the point, counsel. All right. The point is, is that you can take that, I can hold my arm very still, and you could put in straight lines on my arm, right? That's called surgery. We have patients very still to be able to put controlled lines in. So yes, actually, they can be done that way. Well, it's called BDSM too, isn't it? Objection. Sustained. The wounds you see in the genital area are also consistent with somebody laying very still and not moving while someone else lightly runs a knife over them. By lightly, I mean they didn't go way past the skin and have the skin open up, right? I don't think they're consistent with that because they're located from the right hand. They curve up the way a hand would do that on that side. It's maybe somebody left-handed backwards kind of contorting a knife that way might be able to do it, but that seems kind of unusual. You know, my opinion is that these were self-inflicted based on the location, the fact there were multiple superficial wounds in places like the lateral thigh, on the palm, and with this they were all consistent with that same pattern. That's why I have the opinion that I have. I'm not aware of any of this other stuff. I had to evaluate my patient who came in who had a severe traumatic event, who came in with what was clearly what looked like self-inflicted wounds in the form of words. All of these were very consistent with that. That led to my opinion that they needed to have further evaluation. Doctor, can I have the court reporter please read back my question? Because I've actually forgotten it now. I'm sorry. The wounds you see in the genital area are also consistent with someone laying very still and not moving while someone else lightly runs a knife over them. By lightly, I mean they did not go past the skin and have the skin open up, right? So that's true. They are consistent with that as well. And I said no. The answer to the question was no. In your opinion, they're not consistent, but you weren't in the back seat of the car. Correct. Right? Where Ezra McCandless was cut by that knife. Right? Objection, Correct. Your Honor. Assumes facts, not in evidence. Sustained. 
<coughs> you weren't present when Ezra McCandless received the cuts to her body. Correct. You don't, have not seen a videotape of what's happened. I have not. She didn't tell you what happened. Correct. And we all agree medical diagnoses can shift when other information is presented. Objection asked and answered. Sustained. You haven't been given any further information since your day in the emergency room, right? That's correct. My, my medical opinion is based on the patterns of the wounds all fitting into the same scenario. Dr. Tillotson, you were asked some questions about the fact that you are not a paid expert witness in this case, right? Correct. But it's fair to say you have gotten paid for all of your time in this case, right? No, it's not. You're not being paid while you testify? No. All right. The, you are a salaried employee of the Mayo Clinic, right? Correct. And you are being paid your salary, correct? I'm paid my salary for the shifts that I work. Okay. If I work additional shifts, I get paid more. I did not get paid when I was here in March. As far as I know, I'm not paid now. I don't submit anything to get paid. So you have to come here because you've received a subpoena, right? Correct. And you yourself have done other things for pay, like teaching, right? I have, yes. And consulted with uh, other lawyers when they wanted to consult with you, right? Um, yes. And just because a lawyer consults with you or pays you doesn't mean that an opinion's not truthful, right? Correct? Um, again, I, I can't say with 100% certainty. Most of the time, I would imagine that people would not uh, compromise their opinion for money, but some people will. Okay. But you're not aware of any other emergency room doctors in Wisconsin who compromise their opinions for money, are you? I, I don't know of anyone right offhand. Okay. And certainly people testify in cases all the time, and they're paid for their time, right? Right. Because you're a fact witness, meaning you were in the emergency room getting paid for your time, you have to come and testify when given a subpoena, right? Correct. Paid or not? Correct. Right? Not a volunteer job? Correct. Okay. So let me ask you about self-inflicted wounds and people being in distress. Self-inflicted wounds can occur when people are in distress. I think you've testified to that? Yes. That people cut themselves, <coughs> right? Is that right? Correct. And in this particular case, by the way, you did not inspect Ms. McCandless's clothing? Correct. And so you don't know anything about clothing being cut through or not cut through in this particular case? Correct. Or whether some clothing has blood on it and other clothes doesn't it? Does not have blood on it, right? Correct. And any conclusions that can be drawn from Ms. McCandless's clothing are kind of outside of your realm of what you worked on in this particular case, Correct. right? Now, you, although you're not aware of BDSM, you have heard of ritualistic wounds, right? Correct. And I'm again going to show you the transcript of your previous testimony in this case. Oh, what page? Page 30. Page 30. Yes, the problem is that I don't have the copy that's paged the same way you are, so. This is from the court, so. Uh, I understand that for whatever reason, they didn't give me access to that. I have access to the full transcript, but it's not. So if I could just see it. Sure. Thank you. Doctor, I'm going back to the transcript of your previous testimony in this case, right? Mm -hmm. And turning to page 30, yeah. these are my questions, okay? Yeah. So, I asked you, what you're saying is if someone is fighting back, that's unlikely, and that was referring, if you have a recollection, if you need to look earlier, let you know, that occurs to having a these superficial wounds, that would be unlikely to get superficial wounds, right? Right. But at that time, I asked you, if someone is just laying there still, a different person could be inflicting wounds that include parallel lines or superficial, correct? And your answer was, sure. Yep.
Now, when you see people who come in and cut themselves, many times they will acknowledge that they've done it, right? Um, it varies. Actually, it's kind of interesting. One of the things they comment on this chapter here is it says patients with self-inflicted wounds may visit the emergency department. Com Oops. It says patients with self-inflicted wounds may visit the emergency department com claiming an accident, self-defense, or assault. When the patient history, injuries, and forensic evidence are not consistent, the forensically informed emergency clinic is in a unique position to extrapolate the truth. So okay. that the Doctor, I, I hate to interrupt you, but perhaps you misunderstood my question. I don't or think so. perhaps I wasn't very clear then. What I asked you is when you are in the emergency room, not what you've read, but when okay. you're in there, you talk, the, sometimes people will tell you why they cut themselves, Sometimes right? they do, yes. Okay. Not all the time, but sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. But you certainly ask, right? Yes. And they'll typically tell you it's to relieve pain. Um, sometimes they'll tell me it's to relieve pain. And by that, it doesn't mean physical pain. It means psychic pain, right? Or could, emotional pain. Typically, yes. And that can be pain from trauma, right? Correct. And that can also be pain. Trauma can be from being attacked. We can all agree with that, yes. right? Trauma can be for having to fight for your life. We can all agree with that, right? Yes. Trauma can be being cut with a knife in unwanted sexual activity, right? It would be, I imagine. And trauma can be a reason why a person would take a knife and write the word boy into their own arm, correct? Yep. At this time, I have no further questions. All right, any redirect? Mr. Yes, Your Honor. Actually, let's just go to that last area you were being asked about. Uh, could trauma be from killing someone? Yes. Let's go back a little bit. Uh, can I have the transcript counsel that you were using? Actually, I need my own copy counsel. Well, Your Honor, if they're going to give it to the witness, that's fine. I'll use my copy, which is different. I mean, I, I don't want to be rude. If you want to take a look at it, I can go up no, there. No, that's fine. I'll use mine. Okay. That's fine. But this is an official court transcript I use, so I would ask that you please refer to the official court transcript. I am. I'm looking at document 299, which was the full transcript of that hearing as opposed to a partial one. Okay. Can you just hold on one second, sir? May I approach, Your Honor? You want to approach a witness? Go ahead. Yes. yes. Now, Doctor, referring to the transcript, uh, when we talk about it, let's just get context of the questions about the exam. Uh, we're at page 41 of, exhib of document number 299. Uh, you were asked, uh, after you had that initial discussion with her, what did you do next? And your answer was what? Can you just read that for us? It's well, starting at line 25 of page 41 and continuing on to line 1 of page 42. Well, after the initial history, I did a physical exam on her. Okay. So your answer at Mar on March 8th was you did a physical exam of her, correct? correct. And that was before the SANE exam, correct? correct? The portion that counsel was reading you about, what did, were you referring to when you said, uh, we didn't do that examination until the sexual assault nurse examiner was there? That was a pelvic or the intimate exam. So prior to the same nurse arriving, had you seen the uh, marks on her left hand? Um, yes. Had you seen the marks on her right thigh? Yes. You just hadn't at that point in time seen the ones on her pelvic area? Correct. All right. There were uh, a number of questions relating to uh, exhibit number 195 and uh, specifically page 2708 on their characteristics of self-inflicted knife wounds. I'm you recall sorry. that? I, I'm sorry, page 2708? Yes. It's up that okay. chapter from Rosen's. Oh, oh, I, I have the wrong document. If you could just wait one moment. Sure, sure. Get that. I have a lot of paperwork here. Okay. I'm sorry. And what page did you say? 2708. 
DOJ 002708. Thank you. Are you there? Now, Council, you ready? Yes. All right. Uh, when you talked about those, uh, you said they're characteristics of self inflicted knife wounds. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Are those characteristics always present in all self inflicted knife wounds? No. Do some self inflicted knife wounds have different characteristics than what's listed there? Yes. What are these? What are the character? What what does it mean by characteristics of? It basically means um, trends or patterns or what you would expect to see. It's the whole reason I came to the conclusion I felt these were self-inflicted because they had a pattern, and the pattern was on the arm. In 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 words, they were they were superficial, multiple linear ones on the palm, not involving this thing where I imagine if somebody had grabbed a knife or grabbed a knife, there'd be deep cuts through there. They were in the reach of a hand, either sitting down on the side of the leg. They were in the reach of the hand in the groin. And they all seemed to have that kind of same movement that they could be gotten at the groin with the right hand. So they were all consistent with that. So, excuse me, I'm sorry. So if you actually look at there, when they talk about the characteristics, they talk about multiple different things like pattern, going in the direction of the hand, multiple parallel lines, non-dominant side. And they're more commonly on the non-dominant side because the, nom the dominant hand inflicts the wounds. And the area that you described, uh, the uh, injury to the pubic area, was there something specific about it in addition to the uh, lines that you observed, the parallel lines that you observed that uh, you thought was important to note in that uh, examination of those? Well, the thing that was unusual about it is they were all on one side and they were on the right side. They weren't on the left side. That was what I thought was unusual and they were all very superficial. And was there also something about the angle of those injuries that was Right, that they were angled up the way that a hand would go towards the right shoulder. I think I commented on that. So if somebody was cutting themselves or mark, putting the knife against the skin in that area, they would, it would be in the direction that they would be doing that? Yes. All right. Using their dominant hand. Right. Uh, doctor, uh, going back to Exhibit 191, uh, the first page of that uh, exhibit, you were asked about her uh, complaining of the pain and rating it a 10 out of 10. Uh, immediately after that, uh, not the next sentence, sentence after that, did she talk about who, who could come visit her if they wanted? I wasn't involved in that conversation. All right. uh, but does the record indicate that the Patient said that somebody could come visit her? Patient did say friend Jason could come to see her is what's said on here. All right. Now, you were asked some questions about uh, the defendant's inability to recall events. Do you know what the cause of that, her ability to describe to you what happened was? I don't, don't know for sure. Um, you know, it could have been a dissociative disorder. Could have been... You know, people are not always forthright with us. It's hard to know at that time. I assume that it was yeah, due to I'm the trauma. Object to assumption. You said I'm going to allow him to answer in this redirect in this. I don't think it's relying on an assumption. Okay. My, my, I, continue with your answer, doctor. My impression is I saw a traumatized woman who had alleged sexual assault who couldn't re remember what happened. I assumed it was more of a dissociative thing or was my assumption or impression seeing her. Um, you know, I always give the patients the benefit of the doubt because I, I, you know, I'm there to care for them. That's my, that's my only agenda in this case is this was my patient. I just wanted what was best for her. That's all I wanted. And that's why I drew the conclusions that I drew trying to figure out what I needed to do to take care of my patient. Was it, a, uh, uh, did you ever have, or there were questions about that some diagnoses are difficult, some are easier. Was this a difficult diagnosis for you to reach that these injuries were self-inflicted? No. Uh -uh. <coughs> Why not? Because of the pattern. The pattern was all, all consistent with, with that. And As a matter of fact, the police independently came to me. Uh, just name. That's fine. Sorry. 
And uh, Doctor, you were also asked some questions that uh, uh, there were some uh, comments about uh, wounds may be self-inflicted and so forth. Uh, if you could you turn to page uh, DOJ 000072, which is the last page of exhibit 191. Yes. Is there a final diagnosis in there as it relates to the wounds to the right arm? I'm yes. Sorry. Left arm, I'm page sorry. What? I'm sorry, Council. The last page of exhibit uh, 191, which is designated 000072. Um, the answer is, uh, I'm sorry, what didn't you get? If he responded to his question, I didn't yeah. I, I What's the final diagnosis as to the wounds to the left arm? Um, laceration arm without foreign body and issue left self-inflicted. And is there a final opinion or final diagnosis as to the injuries to the thigh? Laceration thigh without foreign body initial right self-inflicted. And that was the final diagnosis by Dr. Horvath? Yes. All right. And that concurs with your diagnosis as well? Yes. You were asked some questions uh, about another spot in your uh, earlier testimony about whether it's possible if somebody had totally, you know, laid totally still, uh, could there be superficial parallel lacerations? Do you recall that? Yes. All right. And your answer then was sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, based on your review of the injuries in this case, uh, are they consistent with some with that situation, and why or why not? Um, the reason that I think that they're not consistent with that situation is number one is the fact that the letters are oriented in the direction that you would write, and they're very controlled in depth. So that's going to take both uh, how much you feel, how deep you go, as well as controlling how the the cuts. The cuts on the palm are very controlled and all in the same direction, consistent more with the, the tip of a, of, a, of a knife or um, uh, going across there, or, or maybe the first part of the blade. Then on the side of the legs, they're more consistent with the hand, and the little stab wounds were not very deep. You know, uh, so they were they were little stab wounds, and they were kind of in an unusual location. I, mean, I almost never really see wounds here, which is what struck me about it. Is here they're on the outside. So when I looked at that, I thought that was weird. But then when I started to, to put things together, it was here these lacerations were in the same place, the hand. And then when we did the exam and the groin, now I could see wounds in the same place. They weren't on the left side, so they seem to be all consistent with that. But inconsistent with somebody being on the outside doing things on the outside leg. It just didn't make any sense to me. And did you, by the way, uh, ever review the uh, medical records relating to the uh, psychiatric or psychological care of the defendant? I have not. Okay, that's fine. Uh, and doctor, in your experience, is it typical for people to lie still while they're being cut? Well, that's why we use anesthesia, because people don't like to lie still when they're being taught. Thank you. Anything else? I have no further redirect for Dr. Tillotson. Ms. Fishby, recross. Thank you. Just really briefly, not to utterly belabel the point, but when um, that would be right where you were, counsel. It's a different page on mine. It's page 8. The counsel for the state said to you, it read you this question uh, after the initial discussion with her, what did you do next? And you said you did a physical exam on her, right? Yes. Correct? And then the very next question was what I asked you, which is how do you conduct a physical exam? And it was in that very next answer where you said with an alleged sexual assault, we don't do that examination until the sexual assault nurse is there. So that part was not done initially until the same nurse arrived. That is actually the totality of what you said on that subject matter. Correct? Yes. In the that, past. Regardless of what you're saying today. Right? Yes, that's, that's what it says in there. Okay. And regardless of what you're saying today, in the past, when you were called to testify, you said, sure, this could be consistent with somebody laying very still and being cut. Right? 
You said superficial things could be, and I answered yes. Superficial okay. things could be, yes. And your work on this case all occurred back in March of last year, right? Correct. You don't have any new information to review. You just have your same medical record, right? Correct. You reviewed it before you came into court back in March. Yes. Correct. You reviewed it again before coming into court today. Correct. And that's the totality of what you reviewed between the two times, Correct. right? No new information about the patient. Correct. And you talked about these marks angling up, going upward, you said, like, towards the shoulder, right? Counsel, I think I'm going to have you for the, I, I'm not comfortable with you going inside oh. the witness box. If That's you can do that from outside right the witness box. How Thank you. This? Yes. Judge, I just want to make sure that um, if I've inadvertently put this picture in front of the camera that it's not shown. Okay, well, um, I don't know if you can angle it towards the jury, maybe come over this I'm, way a I'm little bit more to, to show the doctor. I'm trying to away from the jurors. They've seen this picture. Well, they are the fact finders. Uh, yes. So I, if you're asking the witness, okay. the jury can't see. Okay. Doctor, in this particular picture, these are the wounds to the groin area, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. And the jury There's a, 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 a glare on it. I can't really see the picture. Can you tilt it up just a little bit more? There you go. Thank you. Okay. And showing you this picture, you would agree that not all of these lines are parallel, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Some of them are perpendicular? To each other, yes. Okay. And they don't all necessarily angle up to the right shoulder. They're in different directions. Um, depending on the position of the extremity at that time. But yeah, they all angle up this, this way. Like, really? Even the ones that go the opposite way? Which ones go the opposite way? Well, there's some that go towards so from that the goes, inner side. There so are, that goes up like this? Well, that would actually depend on what direction somebody's pointing the knife, right? Exactly. It could go up or it could go down, right? Yep. Yeah. And, um, Doctor, I think you were asked about contusions, or in other words, what we commonly call bruises, right? Correct. And they don't necessarily show up right away? Correct. Objection, this is beyond the scope of my... It is, uh, and I'm going to sustain, it's beyond the scope of uh, redirect. So bruises would be seen later? Uh, don't Your Honor, I'm going to sustain the okay. anticipated objection. Now, um, you were uh, questioned about trauma both by myself and by the prosecutor in his um, redirect, correct? Correct. And you agree trauma can be consistent with many things, right? Yes. It can be consistent with being attacked? Your Honor, I'm going to object. I mean, I asked one question on it. I'm, for counsel to just go through every single thing again is, I, I, I don't see the... These have all been asked and answered on cross-examination already. It, it was asked and answered a number of times on cross-examination. Correct. And because it was on redirect, I wanted to just ask about three questions about it. Well, uh, why don't you stick with uh, what Mr. DeFore asked? On, well, uh, he said that it is could... whether, oh, I'm sorry. you know, killing somebody uh, could be traumatic. I think it was something along those lines. Killing somebody can be traumatic as well as self-defense or being attacked, correct? Absolutely. And those can be consistent with a hypothesis, right? I, I'm self homicide, self-defense, they can all be consistent with a different hypothesis, right? I'm not sure what you're asking with a different hypothesis. Well, you have a theory about what happened in this particular case, right? No, actually, I don't have a theory. I have a medical opinion okay. based on a reasonable degree of medical certainty. That's what I have. Well, a reasonable degree of medical certainty, since you brought that up, that means different things to different people, right? Isn't that correct? I, I don't know what you mean by that. Well, some people say a reasonable degree of medical certainty means that you're 51% sure, right? It means that that is what my opinion is within a degree of medical certainty based on my training, expertise, and opinion. Whether you want to quantify that, I guess, is going to depend on the individual and the circumstance. So different doctors quantify that in different ways. Fair? Again, I don't know what different doctors do. I'm only one. Okay. Doctor, you can agree that more information can lead to a different diagnosis and a different opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty by another practitioner, correct? Yes. 
and that your opinion was based only on seeing this patient on this day, March 22nd, where you weren't able to get a lot of information, correct? That is absolutely correct. And where you didn't have knowledge of certain other sexual practices that lead to similar injuries, correct? Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Nothing further. Okay. All right. Uh, Dr. Tillotson, I think that is all for you today. All right. Uh, thank you for your time. And is Dr. Tillotson free to go then? Yes, Your Honor. Okay.